Good morning, everyone. Hope you're doing well. Happy Mother's Day for those of you that are mothers or will be mothers one day. We're thankful for you, so I thought, well, let's talk about mothers a little bit this morning. Um, very important role, right, in any, any society. Okay. Let's pray, and then we'll read our theme verse, uh, and then we'll, we'll study this topic of motherhood today. Obviously, a topic we cannot exhaust, right? Big topic. Heavenly Father, we thank you for another beautiful morning you've given to us. Thank you for this opportunity we have to gather together and study your word, and today the topic of motherhood on Mother's Day. Lord, we thank you for mothers. And we thank you for our own mother, Lord, whether our mother was godly or not. We still thank you for our mother and the care that uh, she showed to us. Lord, we pray that you would help us to be grateful for the often thankless and difficult work, uh, the mundane, ordinary work that mothers do. And Lord, we thank you for their love, for their children, even those that have adopted children. Lord, those that grew up with perhaps a relative uh, not their biological mother. We still thank you, Lord, for those that have cared for us as we grew up. And Lord, we pray for your blessing upon our mothers today uh, and their families. You know, Lord, living in a fallen world makes this topic uh, often much more difficult, Lord, than you originally designed for it to be. And Father, we pray that you would help us today to remember the gospel and the hope that we have uh, in Jesus Christ. Lord, that uh, even our mothers, they're not perfect. And Lord, we thank you for the work of grace uh, in their lives. And Lord, we pray for any mother that we may know that may not yet be a Christian. Lord, a follower of your son, Jesus, that you would work in the heart of that mother. And Lord, even in the hearts of our children, Lord, that have not yet professed faith. And Lord, we thank you for this opportunity today. And Lord, we, we pray you bless, bless our time. In Christ's name we pray, amen. amen. Okay. So... Uh, our text is from Proverbs 31, a well-known text. There are many others that could be used, of course. And I'll just read Proverbs 20, 31, 29 through 31 uh, as we get going this morning. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Honor her for all that her hands have done and let her works 
bring her praise at the city gate. Right? That's a, a very nice uh, description of not just motherhood, but even the, the blessings right, that the offspring of motherhood should render uh, to one's mother, even I would say grandmother. So we're thankful for mothers today. Uh, I'm just bringing up the leaked Supreme Court draft, uh, not, to, not to talk a lot about that. Uh, I mean, we'll talk a little bit about it, but you know, the, the, there's the, the irony, of course, uh, in God's providence is that today on Mother's Day, uh, those that are opposed to these, extreme, the, these extremist court justices, as, as they are called, um, their, call, their, their call to arms today is to go into every Catholic uh, mass and disrupt the mass on Mother's Day. Now, we're not Catholics, okay? But Catholics are the ones that are known for opposing abor abortion, more, more so than we are, perhaps. Uh, but that is quite an irony, right? They would actually go into uh, a place of worship, right? It doesn't it matter if they're Muslim, it's still a place of worship. We're not Muslim. Uh, but that, to me, is, is quite, quite an irony for that to happen on Mother's Day. Uh, that this, and I don't know, there, there already have been some reports of certain disruption. Uh, one example, there was a church in Boulder, Colorado, <clears throat> where uh, pro-abortion vandals spray-painted on the front of the church, beautiful brick building, bans off our bodies and my body, my choice. Um, I mean, just va vandalism, right, instead of really thinking about arguments for or against. So again, it's a heated issue we know in our country. It divides a lot of people. and. I just mentioned that because of the days that we were living in. Uh, yesterday morning, uh, several of you here from our church, we went to the Walk for Life uh, at Dream City Church, and it was a real blessing to, go, to be there. I, I was thankful for We had a good crowd that turned up. Our church was actually number three in the list of um, financial sponsorships, which shocked me, uh, to be honest. Uh, that, says, that, that says a lot right there, could be good or bad, uh, but it was a nice walk. It was, it was great to walk with those of you that came out, and uh, I, I really enjoyed uh, that, that moment. Before we walked, uh, a doctor spoke. Uh, I believe he was a gynecologist, and he said something interesting. He said, I have a moral obligation as a doctor to treat an illegal immigrant if I know that they have, need medical care. Right? Apart from the legality, he said, I have a moral obligation. That's the oath that I took. And so he then went on to say, well, I also have a moral obligation to take care of someone uh, medically right? if there's an emergency, even if they weren't born in the U.S. He says there's still that medical obligation. And he was using that reasoning to take it to something that I didn't know could even happen. He said, if there's a baby in the womb, right, the, the littlest patients with, the, with, the, with medical rights too, he said, I have an obligation to help that baby. And he gave an example of open heart surgery done on a baby in the womb that was successful. And, and, it, and when, it, when he talked about that, they, they, gave the, the, they gave that baby an IV. I mean, to, to, to describe what they did, uh, was, it was just quite inspiring to hear him say that. Here's a doctor that works with things and he knows stories. And so uh, that, that was just a, what a blessing to hear that as surgery was performed and the baby was born healthy. Um, our first thought today, again, there's, I, I encourage you to, to uh, add your thoughts. I'll turn the microphone on as we go. But the first thought, our big, big thought here uh, is mothers are necessary for the survival of the human race, right? Uh, I mean, that, that's true, right? There is no real substitute for the earthly family. Uh, there are, I suppose, some counterfeits, but there really is not a, a substitute. There's no alternative for a family, certainly not mothers. Harriet Beecher Stowe supposedly said this, quote, most mothers are instinctive philosophers. That is a great quote. I love that. Um, Billy Sunday said, there is more power in a mother's hand than in a king's scepter. There, there's a lot of truth in that too, isn't there? Uh, so A, fathers are necessary, uh, but the mother carries the baby in her womb. We're not, we're not saying anything bad about fathers here, but the mother has to carry that baby, right? And at this point, I just thought about some of this as I've looked at some Christian books uh, on motherhood. Um, the Bible, not our own culture, not our own cultural practices as a standard for motherhood, right? Christianity is bigger than any single culture's understanding of motherhood. And, and there are little aspects that probably do vary from culture to culture that might, you might think is odd, that this culture does this in reference to motherhood. But the core, right, the, the core that 
is true of all cultures is that whatever the Bible says about mother is true and it's good wherever you live in the world. First of all, pregnancy may be filled with difficulty, pain, and a disappointment, okay? There are some ladies that get pregnant and everything seems to be a joy, right? They seem to have very little uh, suffering, very few complications, um, and they just love it. It just went well. Uh, so there are, there are those stories, but for most women, pregnancy is not a walk in the park, right? And I think all of you mothers here would probably testify to something like that this morning. Pregnancies can often be filled with personal experiences of all kinds of right, physical discomforts that your body goes through and that grows in intensity the closer it comes to, for the delivery of your baby. Some women endure difficult pregnancies that require them, I mean, by, you don't have to raise your hand, but uh, how many of you ladies had to do some type of bed rest in pregnancy, right? It, you were just so worn out. Uh, that's difficult, isn't it, when we hear that, when you have to stay in bed for a few hours a day, maybe longer, maybe even weeks at a time, or you're, you're sick a lot, morning sickness, afternoon sickness, whatever. Some mothers have the terrible difficulty of experiencing miscarriage, right? That's, we know a lot of mothers that have gone through that. Uh, and when it's late in pregnancy, right, it tends to be even more emotional, and the pain of dealing with a loss must just seem unbearable, if not heartbreaking. Um, some mothers give birth to a baby or a boy or a baby girl, only to realize there's been severe damage, right, to the brain, or some type of deformity where the doctor says, look, we really cannot do anything more uh, to save your child. We cannot operate on your child. Uh, I know of a seminary student, um, actually Dr. Peter Jones's daughter, that's what happened to her. Uh, he's Presbyterian. Uh, he, if, if you know of his ministry, he's a great guy. And the baby was not going to live, but only a few hours. And so he, he went to the, him or Dennis Johnson. Dennis Johnson is a father-in-law. I don't know if you know that. Both of them taught at Westminster. Uh, they baptized the baby in a few hours. That baby died. I mean, that's heartbreaking, right? My wife and I know someone that, uh, you know, they, they shared with us the, the, just the difficulty of losing a child, a mother. And every year, right, it's, it's been years, it's been a few decades. Every year, the day that that child died, it's a sorrowful day for them, and they still talk about it. Um, this church was the, when we came back to this church when we first moved here, <clears throat> do you remember the first funeral that I attended, my wife and I? Who it was for? It was for Libby. That was the first miscarriage funeral I've ever been to in my life. I still have that little cowboy boot invitation or the, out in my office. That is heartbreaking, right? When you experience things like that, that was the Keener family. Um, but these things, again, for, especially for the women, uh, the mother, uh, it can be very difficult, right? You, you will never forget that, that day the rest of your life, um, the, the agony and the pain of that loss. Two, many mothers testify to the joy of giving birth even though labor is painful. Okay, I've also heard this from many mothers. Um, now, we do sometimes hear the mother that says, look, I gave birth to one that was terrible. I don't want any more. I'm not going to have any more kids because it was so difficult. That's the response to pregnancy too, right? And yet many mothers tell us that in spite of all of the pain, the discomfort, the suffering, you look back and all of those funny th stories that are they're funny now, but they weren't then about the changes of your body, the changes of, in your appetite, your taste buds, and all those things, even the, you, know, you couldn't sleep and the baby kicking and so on uh, in the evening. It, it, it's almost as if when, when that baby is brought to the mother, right, for the first time and that baby uh, touches the mother and the mother holds the mother, many mothers have, have described kind of this euphoric joy that over, overcomes them, that all that pain just like, it, in a sense, it, it just disappears, it's still there, but the joy that comes out of the pregnancy and the birth, right, when a mother holds her child for the first time and looks down on that child, right, when the child is on the breast of the mother, and the, the gentle breeze from the mother's nostrils, right, goes across the face of that child, there is a connection there that that child knows, right, I want to be with my mother. It's like an instantaneous, uh, and it's instinctive as well, right, this is my mom, and I want to be with her. Uh, it's something that is quite beautiful. Uh, to see. And, and you think about this, these ladies are sometimes exhausted if it's been a long labor, right? 
And they get this boost of energy and joy when they first hold their newborn. I mean, that's the beginning uh, in many ways of just seeing the sacrificial nature of motherhood, right? What they give up for the children. It, it is quite remarkable. Uh, I mean, motherhood is something that's very good uh, that the Bible describes, even in a fallen world. Three, again, if you have comments, uh, especially ladies, please raise your hand and add your thoughts uh, because I have not given birth and I did not plan to. <laughs> yes. Just one word. It's not just miscarriage, stillborn. Yes. I, I, we had one. Good point. And yeah. it was mm. almost nine months. Wow. And it was um, nuchal cord, which is the baby's mm -hmm. umbilical cord was wrapped around at least five times on the baby's neck. Yeah, that's uh, just those are heartbreaking things, aren't they? That that's the consequence of living in a fallen world uh, that we have to deal with. Um, three, the sorrows of motherhood began when sin entered the world. Right, Genesis three sixteen. I'll read that in a moment. Uh, in Genesis one, though, God gave the command to Adam and Eve, right, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, right, with image bearers. So that's clearly there in the first chapter of the Bible. And yet that command, it never got off the ground, uh, right? No one was born. Sin entered the world before any human being was born. So again, Genesis 1, we already have the command uh, regarding to motherhood. That's how important, that's how fundamental it is to a society. Uh, again, pregnancy, according to the scriptures, is to, be, uh, is to occur in the context of marriage. Now, we know it doesn't always happen that way today. Um, two chapters later, we read of something terrible happening. Adam and Eve disobeyed God, right? They listened to the serpent, Satan. With full knowledge of God's commands, Eve listened to the serpent, right? We, we think maybe Adam was there. He was, was he being passive? Was he being silent? Um, they're both at fault, but she didn't follow God's word at that point. And so then we start reading in Genesis chapter 3 about the judgment that followed, right? In that. And I'll read just one verse. Genesis 3.16, this is where God, God addresses the serpent, Adam and Eve, and this is what he says to Eve. To the woman he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. I'm primarily focusing upon the issue of the pain in childbearing, right? All of those years, uh, that, that, that's a part of a consequence of sin, right? It's, 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 it's common judgment in our world that we have to deal with. Four, our ideas of motherhood should not be based exclusively on our culture. Now, I'm not saying that we have a bad culture. Please don't misunderstand me, especially with our heritage. But today's culture and how secular our nation has become, uh, I don't really want to listen to a lot of uh, advice on motherhood from people that don't believe the Bible. Right? They may have some good insights medically that we can, we can pick up, nutrition and all that stuff. But when it comes to the concept of what, the core idea of being a mother, I mean, I don't want my daughter learning from them. I should say, maybe that's a more personal way of saying that. Um, I don't want to embarrass her, but I, I don't, right, uh, when we think about that. So we should remember that the Bible does say some important things about motherhood, right? And there are people today that, of course, are rejecting uh, what the Bible seems to be clearly uh, teaching, right? Men cannot get pregnant. Uh, the only way you can come to the conclusion if you say that the woman can identify as a man, therefore she can get pregnant, and he can get pregnant, right? It's, just, it's a ridiculous argument. We all know it, right, uh, that, that people are saying this, and yet people that should be more serious in this are promoting this idea that men uh, can get pregnant. Um, that is not something that we, we would believe, okay? So we have this whole secular idea that uh, it's not always positive towards the concept of motherhood in our day. If anything, you could even say that traditional, right, biblical motherhood is kind of laughed, scoffed, and mocked at uh, in, in, by many uh, in some of our institutions today. Uh, not everyone, but it's, it's common. B, feminism disrupts God's purpose for motherhood. Okay. I, I, I tried to read some articles by feminists, they're not Christians, to at least get some of their definitions. Again, I know this is a big topic. Uh, Proverbs 14.4 is an interesting verse. Where there are no oxen, the manger is empty, but from the strength of an ox come abundant harvest. Now that, that, that can apply to many things. And I, and I had a, a professor that talked about this in class years ago. 
and he applied it to the concept of a home. It, it applies here to a farm, right? I mean, you can have a picture-perfect uh, farm, and you have maybe a cow, a cow that never goes out in the field, and, and the stall is always going to be clean, right? And th wouldn't we all want that? Beautiful, right? Uh, never do any work. The cow's feet are always clean. It walks on concrete all the day, and so on. You never have to, you know, very little work to keep the, the farm clean. Uh, but this concept would be, you know, if you don't want to have children, right, then everything's going to be clean and perfect, right, in, in your house. Uh, but you're going to really lose out. There's not going to be the abundance of harvest that comes longer right, down the road uh, when you have children and so on. Uh, I, I like what G.K. Chesterton, you know, you read him and you smile, at least I do. He said, it, feminism is mixed up with a muddled idea that women are free when they serve their employers, but slaves when they help their husbands. Uh, he had a way of, with words. He saw some of this coming uh, decades ago, uh, the things that we're struggling with today. I think the painful truth of feminism is that Eve tempor temporarily became the first feminist, right? For a short time, she modeled that in following the serpent's argument and reasoning. And yet I do believe God showed mercy to both Adam and Eve uh, that they repented of that. Rosie.org, an Australian website, describes feminism this way, right? This person does not appear to be a Christian, so I'm trying to use her words. She says, feminism is a social movement and ideology that fights for the political, economic, and social rights for women. I mean, I guess so far that may sound, you know, we could perhaps agree to some of that. Feminists believe that men and women are equal and women deserve the same rights as men in society. The feminist movement has brought for has, has fought for many different causes, such as the right for women to vote, uh, I have a comment on that in a moment, the right to work and the right to live free from violence. There are different versions of feminism. Uh, this is just a summary of the three big versions called the first wave, the second wave, and the third wave. The first wave of feminism happened in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, right? It was over issues like voting rights and things like that. Okay, uh, maybe land ownership and so on. The second wave of feminism came in the 60s and the 70s. This had a much broader scope of rights they were campaigning for, and, and this becomes even more specific. These, quote, quoting the website, these include the right for equal pay, the right to live free from both physical and sexual violence, and the reproductive rights like access to contraception and safe and legal abortion. Okay, that's, that's when Roe v. Wade, that's in the era when that was passed. Feminists, right, uh, in some countries, they've, they've never even seen this, right? There are places in the world today where they, they, they wouldn't even live this way. And then the third wave uh, started in the 90s and continues on to today, and some of this stuff is really radical, right? It's scary, uh, some of the stuff uh, that we see. So again, I don't, I don't wanna just harp on feminiz feminism all this morning, but I do think that that is a clear framework in our culture that is against a lot of what the Bible says about motherhood. Number one, feminism can be anti-children and may think that a barren womb is a blessing. Right? That's, that's another irony of some aspects of feminism, right? What they're learning, right? We don't wanna have kids. Uh, the career is more important than kids. Some feminists have made public statements about this, right? Almost the equivalent of a wedding vow. And why are they doing this? Why are they making vows not to have kids? What are some common popular reasons, whether they, whether they mean them or not? Want to save the environment, right? Climate change is com coming up there. I know he does not believe in it. I don't believe in it uh, the way it's promoted, right? But they will say, I want to save the environment, so it's selfish of me to have kids. They're going to further pollute the environment. Overpopulation is another common one. Uh, you know, I, I think Miley Cyrus made some type of a vow, right? I will never have children because I just can't. Our world is in a state of crisis. Okay, yes, we have a, I'm not sure where the microphone is, but uh, there are other reasons why people have given, right, almost like it's a virtuous vow for a woman to say, we don't want to have kids. Okay. Um, a lot of it is they're afraid to bring children into the world because of how crazy it is, but that yeah. also comes from believers too. Right, yes, To where they just <laughs> are like, everything is so bad, especially, you know, COVID and now, right. to where they're scared to have kids, but you're like, every point in time in, in the world's existence, there has been chaos. Like, we are right. not the first to experience hardships and chaos. So it's just kind of insane. But then, like you said, like Miley Cyrus is like, you know, the whole popul overpopulation right. 
is they influence people, don't they? They do, and they use the celebrities to help influence the population that we're overpopulated when right. we're actually underpopulated. Right. So it's a lot of obvious lies, but it you know just to pray that we as believers don't fall into those lies of you know we need to save the planet and we don't need to overpopulate <laughs> because there's right. not enough food. And with everything that's going on, it's easy to fall into that just because of what's being pushed in the media right now, the food shortages and everything like right. that. So it's easy to fall into the lie without realizing that's what you're doing. Yes, and I have a question for you. Were you, were you and your husband ever scared to have kids? Did, that ever, did you ever have any moments where you're thinking, I don't know if we want to have kids, or did it never, never occur nothing? Uh, no. Okay. I think, I think, well, for me personally, I didn't want to have kids after I had Johnny. Oh. And so God totally changed my heart. Jo Johnny <laughs> changed your heart. That's great. Man, Johnny, that's great. That's a great compliment. Yeah. Yeah. She, she didn't want to have kids for 10 years. And the past 10 years oh. we've been married, we've been having kids every year. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. <laughs> Their family was out at the Walk for Life. It was great. I'll see them out there. Okay, uh, again, so th there are, so I, I, can't, I cannot tell you the, the name of the person, but I, I have a very reliable source from an intelligent lady, very intelligent, that just said this to someone that I know just a couple of days ago. I did not, I will just say this, she's a freshman in college and she already has a scholarship to Cambridge for her master's. She's brilliant and she's committed to, I do not, er, I never want to have a, a baby. I do not want to be pregnant, that's bad. I want to focus on my career. It's very common thinking, uh, and, it, and it's quite sad. So, again, th those are some of the arguments that are that are out there. And my point is that our, our young people, they are being influenced by this, or may, maybe subtly, uh, whether they know it or not, just in popular culture, right? Uh, they don't want, maybe they don't want to strive to have, to be a mother and to have kids and so on. All right. Um, two, feminism is feminizing boys, men, and the family. Right? I mean, to me, this seems to be obvious. Uh, I don't know if all of you would agree with this, but this just seems to be something, right? Especially a Christian man, right? You, we just can't speak what the Bible says without being called a misogynist, right? Anything that disagrees with a feminist viewpoint, is we are lumped in with the bad guys that treat women bad, right? I, I looked at a, I have it here somewhere, I looked at a Psychology Today article uh, j just to confirm, like, what is a misogynist, right? Um, it means someone that hates women, right? That's the, that, that, it's thrown around casually, right? Typically, it's an unconscious hatred that men form early in life. Off, this is from Psychology Today, right? 12 ways to spot a misogynist. And when I read through this article, and, and I can read through some of the 12 points, I noticed that they're kind of equating and conflating, right, all of the bad characters that use women in life with... Christians that actually believe this is what the Bible says about men and women. And almost to the point where we, either we're going to be silenced, and to be silent means you're not going to be called a misogynist, but if you're going to just teach the simple truth of Scripture, we're going to be called a misogynist, us guys, right? Especially the white guys like me. Uh, you're bad uh, type of a thing, right? You just want to do this to control women uh, and so on. And so, you know, you, you look through some of these, these thoughts of what they're describing, some of the things that they're saying, right, we would have to recognize are true, right? There are men that treat women bad and so on, but they're, they're, it's a blanket statement now uh, that if you disagree with that, if you say anything, you're, you're just labeled uh, a misogynist, someone that hates women. And, of course, the thought that uh, what the Bible says about male leadership in a church that's misogynistic by today's standards, right? It's just promoting more and more evil uh, along with it. And our young boys in school, if they're in public education, man, they better keep their lips zipped. I've noticed in college, the boys are afraid to talk. And this is at a Christian school. They're afraid to speak up. It's a trend I've seen for the last uh, four years. Um, they're afraid to stand up and say anything that is in a sense. Of, there are a few that will, but most of them just remain silent. Most of the people who talk are ladies in the class. Uh, the, the whole college population has reversed itself. Uh, women dominate uh, colleges now more than men. Is, is it like 60 to 40 percent, something like that? When you get into the master's level, women really dominate uh, more than men. Uh, and so it's as if men are just being pushed out uh, to the margins, right? You better agree. Uh, or, or just be quiet. So it, it is sad uh, to see that happening. 
three, feminism has been a means of eroding public education and our population. Okay, again, I don't want to be overly harsh uh, on this topic, but uh, Ben Shapiro is not a Christian, but if you look at some of his discussions on what elementary school right, teachers, the trans TikTokers are promoting, man, it's like scary and it's weird. Uh, I do not, I would not want my child sitting in, under one of these teachers what they're being taught. It's, it, one person said, it's, this is stuff is satanic, what they're teaching them. It's demonic, uh, what, what they are pushing on our kids. And it is, there is a spiritual battle going on here. I have no doubt about that, right? Yeah, Steve has a, a comment. Um, front line, right? Steve is right there on the front lines uh, in this issue. Well, I would just... Uh I, I don't know that you can um, understate it, or if you are, you're understating it. You're not overstating anything. <laughs> okay. Um, because uh, just uh, feminism and the other ideologies that are kind of pervasive in our postmodern culture um, have uh, really taken a toll here. And um, it's I just kind of, I have a, a memory in my mind of like a 12-year-old boy being corrected in sort of a... Mm -hmm using uh, kind of the, quote, newer techniques. Um, yeah. And, um, mm. it, you know, kind of manipulative uh, language kind of a thing. And, him, and a, right. it, you know, and a sort of a sweet tone in him walking away, kind of mm. mocking it, you mm -hmm. know. So at some level, like, you know, he kind of realized and reacted against against that. But anyways... Yeah, it's, it's, it's very sad. There was an ABC uh, local news report, I can't remember the date, several months ago, but they were celebrating, you know, maybe it was the start of school, maybe it was back in at the beginning of the school year, I don't know, but they, they, the camera went into the classroom, right, they were showing the new decorations and almost every, this elementary school, they were all decorated in the gay pride colors, symbols, you know, the, the slogans and all that, as if all of this is something that's really good. Um, Again, how, how, I don't even know how I could teach in a situation like that if I was an elementary school teacher. I don't, I don't know what I would do. Uh, I think I would probably have to get a different line of work if that was the case. But again, uh, the, the next point is just a short point. You can look up on your own. This is a point Al Moro made in one of his um, podcasts years ago. Feminism leaves women unfulfilled and happy. This was even back, this was as far back as 2009, and he's quoting uh, Maureen Dobbs, New York Times author, who in her research is saying studies are showing that women are not happy even though they're getting all the things that they, they wanted uh, from what the men had. She says women are, these are her words, women are gloomier and men are getting happier. She said, did the feminist revolution end up becoming something that benefits men more than women? And so she has a lot of interesting quotes there. She's quoting uh, other authors and she just notices she's quoting some hard, hard figures here. Um, you know, she says, since 1972, only 7% of students playing high school sports were girls. Uh, today, that number is like almost reversed itself. And she's just talking about the changes, the subtle changes uh, in our society that have taken place. She's not saying girls can't play sports, but she's just noticing all these subtle changes that have taken place over the years. It's leaving women, right, not with a sense of fulfillment. It's kind of having the opposite uh, effect with this. Um, so that's, I don't want to, again, I don't want to belabor that point uh, because we, would do, we do, we do want to talk about the blessings of motherhood today. Five, feminism often openly disagrees with some teachings of the Bible. Okay, that, that, that's, where, um, that's where many feminists are at. Uh, they do not accept many things that are taught in the Bible and it places us at odds with them. Uh, we, 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 can't, we can't accommodate them in their theological views if the scripture is teaching something different. I mean, even if I wanted to, which I don't, I can't do that, right? Um, and, and because we are going to remain fast, stand fast in what God's word says, right, we're going to be singled out more and more as just people that just can't get along with other people, right? We already know that there are names, uh, we recall all, the, all these names and so on. So the conclusion there is that feminism is often at odds with biblical femininity. I read an interesting article by Susan Hunt. She wrote a book, Spiritual Mothering, uh, that she has some great things to say. But I wanted to quote from something about the uh, early movement on voting rights that uh, women strove for. And this is by uh, Summer Jagar, and this is on the Founders website. It was published in 2019. It's called The Lies of Feminism. And listen to what she says here about that early movement. 
Uh, her quote, here, here are her words, quote, but let's be clear about something. What you believe about women and men is not political, it's really more theological. What you believe about people, our nature, our purpose, flows from what you believe about God. What the early feminists believed, believed about God's design for women and men, particularly in how we relate to each other, is still alive today. A quick perusal of the writings, writing of women such as Susan B. Anthony and Emma Goldman tells us that they believe that being a wife, right, being a wife means little more than being a housekeeper. It is a life of drudgery, mistreatment, and servitude. Wives are essentially parasites that are socially and individually useless. One must be stupid to believe that marriage is anything other than a commitment to failure and misery. In order for a woman to be truly free, she must not enter into a marital union. Women must be freed, not from sin, but from men. And she talks about those early, you know, ladies like Susan B. Anthony, they were not just nice ladies that were, you know, knitting blankets at home. They had a real agenda, and it is not good. Okay, Steve, follow up or comment. Well, Sum Summer is uh, James White's daughter. I'm sorry? Summer, the author oh, really? of that, is James uh, Where White's, does she live? Uh, I think uh, in the valley somewhere. Oh, really? But uh, I didn't know that. Denise, it's a great article. Denise, uh, have you read that before? I haven't. But, yeah, it's a great article. But Denise has listened to uh, their podcast, The Sheila. This was from uh, 2019. Looks like Mar March 4th, 2019, filed under feminism under Founders Movement. How many pages is it? It's about five pages. Ooh, she's called a Sheologian. Yeah. That's it, right? They have a, a, a podcast. Yeah, she makes a joke about that. Okay. Yeah. So it's it's a really good really good article and. Uh, you know, it's something for us to think about. So thank, I didn't know that. Thanks, Steve, on that. Okay, let's talk about maybe more, the more positive here, too. Th this, our, our second major point, again, it should not be controversial. I'm sure that you could twist it into something that's of controversy, but God's purpose was to use a mother, right, mothers, to bring about our Redeemer, uh, our Savior. Um, that, 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 that thought alone, right, strikes me as being quite remarkable. Um, in this sense, the role of mothers in Israel was necessary for our redemption, right, leading to the birth of Jesus. A, this is made known in the first gospel promise in Genesis 3.15, right? I put that verse in there for you. This is God speaking to who? He's speaking to the serpent, right? I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring or your seed and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Again, um, I believe that is a first gospel promise, right, of what's going to happen when Jesus enters our world, right, and dies on the cross and then eventually rises from the dead for our salvation. Number one, from the fall onward, we see the joys and sorrows of motherhood. Um, this, again, is obvious to us. Genesis 3.16 records God's first words to Eve after she sinned, and right, to the woman he said, right, pain and childbearing. That's going to that's gonna be a reality now in this fallen world. Did any of you watch the short Michael Knowles debate with the, me the female medical student uh, just, a, I think it was a couple days ago, on the, on the, the documents that came out, the leaked document? Um, it, it's, it's, I think it was 18 minutes. I watched it. it quite, she, this is an intelligent young woman, a medical school student, right? Her name was Bronte. And the discussion was, when does life begin? And again, a short debate, they, they treated each other with respect, but clearly they're on different sides uh, of the issue here. And she would, you know, one of her arguments later on at the end of the, of the debate was one reason why women should have a right to abortion is because, you know, it really messes up our bodies. And I don't want to lose my figure. Right? It, it, it goes back into the whole external beauty. I mean, we just read something about that in Proverbs, right? Uh, external beauty is fleeting. And so that was one of her practical arguments right at the end, like I should have the right to, to end this if I wish. And I mean, you, you almost felt so sorry. Uh, again, brilliant lady, she's gonna be a doctor, she's gonna be promoting this stuff. You almost feel sorry for her promoting that kind of a, of a thinking uh, when she said that. I mean, of, of course, you, you ladies that have given birth know Pregnancy does kind of mess with your body, doesn't it? <laughs> I mean, I, I've heard ladies talk about this, right? It's like I, I feel like a whole different person now that, I, that I've given birth. Um, 
Yes, but I mean, I'm thankful for ladies that have had all these kids and that, that, that they, 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 didn't, they didn't make the decision based upon that, right? There's something, I think, quite beautiful about that. Um, we live in a fallen world, right? Uh, it, it, but, but children are still a blessing. So my point here is that motherhood should not be put off simply because it changes a woman's body, right? Which is a popular argument to use. Yeah. Okay, yes. The thing is that even if you don't get pregnant, as you grow old, your body oh. can never be the same again. <laughs> You'll be messed up. So what's the point? And, 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 and as men, we can't really, we, 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 our bodies change too, right? So that's true. Uh, imagine number two, imagine if you were Eve, the first sorrow of motherhood occurred when Cain murdered Abel. Imagine if that was uh, your situation. I mean, obviously the pain and the sorrow was there in giving a birth, but imagine how you would have felt if you found out that your firstborn killed your secondborn, murdered him in the field. I mean, that would be terrible sorrow, right, to think about. Uh, the rest of your life. When Cain finally left the home, I don't know if his mother saw him ever again. Okay, And this was a situation in which uh, a son was guilty of something, right? How much more, right, what did Mary go through when she saw her son crucified at the cross? She knew more than we, than we think she knew, in my opinion, right? She was pondering from the very moment of, I mean, her son was not guilty of anything, and yet here he's being uh, executed uh, by the Romans. Um, three, Sarah was old and barren, right? Barrenness is a common theme in the Bible, uh, in the Old Testament, yet God blessed her womb with Isaac. Uh, again, the theme of barrenness uh, with a wife of a patriarch in the book of Genesis, right, is a very common theme. Um, the theme of barrenness emphasizes not just the bitterness that she may have experienced, a disappointment uh, of a mother that desires to have a child, but it also represents the power of God to do the impossible, right? She names Isaac laughter. I mean, she's just overjoyed in her old age when Isaac is born. And all of these statements now are meant to promote the idea that motherhood is something good. Uh, I, I, it would be wonderful if our young ladies just want to be mothers. Uh, that is a great blessing for Isaac and Rebecca, right? This couple had some real challenges. Uh, I'm going to actually read from Genesis 25 just to remind us uh, about something. And I, I think initially it was the father's, maybe it was the father's fault here on, on why these tensions developed uh, in this home. But does anyone know what, what, what is in Genesis 25, this, this statement? Isaac and Rebecca are married. She's also barren, right? Uh, we, we read about that. God answered his prayer. He was praying for his wife to give birth, starting at verses 19 and following of Genesis 25. Uh, in fact, verse 21, right? She was barren, and the Lord granted his prayer. He was praying. He, they're, they're in their 40s. And then we read that she's pregnant, not just with one, but with twins. And we read this in the Bible. And the Lord said to her. Now, this would be an example of God speaking to the wife, and the husband doesn't listen. Two nations are in your womb and two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The older shall serve the younger. Now, jump down to verse 28. Isaac loved Esau because he ate his game, but Rebecca loved Jacob, right? This is a classic example of favoritism in the house. Uh, the father favors one son, and the mother favors the other son. The son that she was favoring happened to be the covenant son, right? He was the one that was to inherit the covenant promise from his father Isaac. And yet it seems to me that Isaac, right, for many years of his life, right, I don't know if this was two decades, he's fighting against God's word that is stated here clearly. He's trying to make the eldest son the one to receive the covenant promises. And it's as if he's living his life, he won't listen to God's word, and so it, it divides him and his wife practically. And of course, motherhood, right, for Rebecca must have been a very difficult thing uh, to, to, to live with someone like Isaac. Uh, they, they both treat each other in ways that are n really not very kind, but that's another example of motherhood in the book of Genesis. Five, polygamy, right? This never solved really anything, to, right, in the Old Testament. Common practice in the ancient Near East, the uh, patriarchs copied that practice, uh, especially the kings of Israel later, they, they did what God said don't do in Deuteronomy 7, 17. Uh, Jacob and all of the, the polygamy in his life, the, what, what, what a disaster, right, from a human perspective that family was. 
those sons were fighting with each other a lot. Uh, that story of Genesis is rich with family counseling uh, examples of what not to do. Uh, when you look at what, what he lived, Jacob had a very hard life in my understanding. Right? He was chosen, but he had a very difficult life, uh, be, partly because of his own disobedience, but also uh, in the lives of his children. And yet God takes, takes, takes that example, right? And that is the nation to form this covenant that will lead to right, a mother in Israel giving birth to our Savior. Okay? Six, uh, this is like take your pick. What do you want to talk about? We have Tamar. Moses' mother, Rahab, Ruth, Michael, I don't know if she was a mother, I put her in there because I didn't know, Job's wife, Jezebel, right? These are just some examples of a whole variety of what motherhood looked like differently. Some believed God's promises of salvation, some did not. Some fought really against those promises and were quite evil uh, in their actions. Again, the reason why I brought up Michael is because that was David's first wife, but Without his permission or consent, Saul took his wife from David and gave her to another man, and I don't know if she had children with him, okay? She didn't have any children with David. And so all of these things relate to the theme of motherhood, and they created all kinds of different emotions and, and reactions. Uh, which one of these ladies, right, was kind of a single, kind of a, went through, uh, experienced widowhood? Uh, anyone here in the list? Or I should have put Naomi in there, shouldn't I, uh, from the book of Ruth? But we may come back to that if you want to look at any of those passages to talk about mothers uh, if we have time at the end. Again, seven, in spite of these challenges, Proverbs 31 praises motherhood. Again, this is that poem that makes some mothers feel guilty. Uh, I don't want to do that this morning. Some people believe that it's really just a perfect uh, a feminine uh, portrayal of perfect righteousness. And so it should point us to Christ first before your household, whether it's organized or disorganized or whatever. Okay? Uh, it's obviously a high standard. It's a, it's a beautiful poem on uh, Proverbs 31, and maybe we should read that briefly, Proverbs 31 on Mother's Day. There's a lot of, lot of wisdom in here, uh, Proverbs 31. Does anyone have the microphone want to read that for us? It starts, it does not start in verse 1. Um, let me turn there real quick. If anyone would like to read that for us, you can probably start around verse 10. Although there's great, there's great motherly advice in verses 1 through 9. Very good advice to a ruler. Who would like to read that? Someone the microphone. Proverbs, Proverbs 31, Proverbs 31. 10. 31. Okay, ready? Who can find a virtuous wife? For her worth is far above rubies. The, the heart of her husband safely trusts her. So he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flakes and willingly works with her hands. She's like the merchant ship. She brings her food from afar. She also rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household. And a portion of her maid servant, she considers a field and buys it. From her profit, she plants a vineyard. She gates herself with strength and strengthens her arms. She perceives that her merchandise is good and her lamb does not go out by night. She stretches out her hand to the dye staff and her hand holds the spindle. She extends her hand to the poor. Yes, she reaches out her hand to the needy. She's not afraid of snow for her household, for all her household is clothed with scarlet. She makes steps, steps tree for herself. Her clothing is fine and linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates. When he sits among the elders of the land, she makes linen garments and sells them and supplies sashes for the merchant. Strength and honor are her clothing. She shall rejoice in the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and on her tongue is the law of kindness. She watches over the ways of her household. 
and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. Many daughters have done well, but you excel them all. Charm is deceitful, and beauty is passing. But a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her the fruit of her hand, and let her own work works praise her in the gates. Amen. Good. That's a wonderful poem uh, in Hebrew. So I'm going to move quickly to the next. Thank you for reading that. The next few thoughts here as we close. Be the New Testament praises godly mothers who persevere in faith, right? Um, number one, the drama of redemption involves a mother and a child. Uh, now, however you understand Revelation 12, uh, it's, it's an apocalyptic text. But notice there, when you're, if, you, if you take some time to re look through the first five verses, we, it, the, the language of motherhood is there, right? She was pregnant and cried out in pain, and she was about to give birth, and there's a red dragon, right, that wants to devour the child as soon as the child is born. Right? so that it might devour her child the moment he was born, Revelation 12, 4. She gave birth to a son, a male child. Now, I think everyone agrees that child is Jesus. Right? That, that's all I want to emphasize there. I, I mean, it's a, it's a beautiful statement about redemption comes through the, through the virgin birth. Right? We believe in that. That's, again, very important in Christian teaching, the virgin birth of, of Jesus Christ. Uh, two, younger widows, this is what Paul says, right? Younger widows should remarry and have children. Again, it, it's just another example of the New Testament's teaching, 1 Timothy 5.14. I counsel younger widows to marry, to have children, to manage their homes, and to give the enemy no opportunity for slander, right? Promoting motherhood. Motherhood is something good, especially in the church. And then three, uh, this, let's look at this verse, uh, if you have your Bibles. I'd like to know what some of you think this means. Um, it's not an easy verse, 1 Timothy 2.15. I'll turn, turn there briefly. Um, I'll, I'll read it, and then I'll, I have a couple of comments from a brief comment of what it, what it could mean, but it's, there is not an easy answer to this. I'll just give you a, a heads up on that. 1 Timothy 2.15 says, Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. This may be... A, a good opportunity if you have a study Bible that may give you some tips on what to, you know, how to process that. But I was in a, years ago in a class and uh, a young lady raised her hand. She did not like this verse because she, she did not want to get married. She, she wanted to be a, a, a scholar and go on to get her doctorate. And so she was fighting with the professor over this verse. She says, I, I don't like the, this verse in the Bible. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, I don't think we ever came to an answer on what the verse meant in the class. Uh, does anyone want to throw out a guess on what you think that might mean? It, it, it doesn't mean anything bad. I think we can all agree upon that, right? There are at least seven different interpretations of this throughout church history. I'm going to summarize a brief article from Andreas Kostenberger. Many of you know him, right? He's a great scholar. I've learned a lot from him. And he's quoting uh, some works, uh, a work done in 1995, Tom Schreiner, many of you know him, with H.S. Baldwin. The book is entitled Women in the Church, A Fresh Analysis of 1 Timothy 2, 9 through 15. The title should already tell us that the context begins uh, several verses earlier, and that may help us uh, understand. Well, what does this mean, like, the word save? That's an issue, right? Normally this word refers to salvation from sin. Uh, and I'm going to summarize. I don't know that I agree with him, but I'm going to at least give you uh, his conclusion, and kind of you, that way you can, you can take it from there. And here's what he says. Since then, I've been able to look at 1 Timothy 2.15, this is Kostenberger speaking, from every conceivable angle, I have looked at the history of interpretation, the seven major views on the phrase, saved by childbearing. The meaning of the word saved, that's sozo in Greek, and childbearing in 1 Timothy 2.15 and so on. My conclusion in 1 Timothy 2.15, Paul says that women will be spiritually preserved, that's, the, that's his definition of save, spiritually preserved from Satan by adhering to their God-ordained role related to family and the home. This is contrasted with Eve who transgressed those boundaries and fell into temptation. And that's from verse 14, the verse prior to this. So that's kind of how he's saying this. It's, 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 a, it's a reference to you will be preserved from Satan's right, false teaching and heresies if you remain uh, in the Christian home uh, with bearing of children. 
Now that doesn't mean that you have to give birth to be saved. That, that would not be what the, I, I don't think that's what it would be saying, right? But that is, a, I mean, that, that's a really important verse uh, for us to ponder uh, that motherhood is a blessing. You know, the, the New Testament doesn't say anything negative about having children that I know of. Um, so it's something that's generally good. He has a few more points, but his, his overall point is it's, it's a promise that uh, godly women will be preserved, protected from Satan's deception. Uh, and there, there are some other arguments surrounding those verses that seem to support that. I'm going to just say something briefly about four, four, five, and six. Older wives, mothers have an important role to play in the church, right? That's the Titus 2, 3 through 5 passage. Wonderful passage about the role that older women have in the church. Uh, and th that's, a, that's great. Uh, Susan Hunt believes in her book, Spiritual Motherhood, that maybe the word nurture, the concept of nurture, is really what Paul is, is stating there. Five is a practical question. How can we encourage Christian mothers in an unbelieving home, right? We have Christian mothers, and probably every congregation has this, uh, where other people in the, in the home are not Christians. The husband is not a Christian. The, the, the children are not Christians. What can you do to encourage those mothers? Uh, six is an important one. Single Christian mothers, they, they need our help. Uh, every, probably now every church has single Christian mothers uh, that, that can use you know, support uh, from both their extended family and help from the church. And then seven, this is where I want to conclude this morning. Mothers and grandmothers, right? Are you heartbroken over a child or a grandchild? This is where the rubber meets the road, right? Um, many Christian mothers are still disappointed, right, with maybe how a child turned out. They still haven't believed the gospel or so on. And so I met with four of our widows. We had a fun time last Tuesday. Um, I won't tell you what we did. It was so fun. But I will say this. This Tuesday at church, we're going to meet again from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m., okay? It's not restricted to widows, but that's the focus that we're, that we're going to gather. It's going to be a bring your own lunch. You've got to brown bag it or Tupperware it, okay? That's our, co our goal. And we're just going to spend a couple of hours talking to one another, getting to know each other more, fellowshipping. I enjoyed hearing the stories of some of these ladies. I asked them some stories like, did you go on a honeymoon, things like that. Uh, which one of you got a speeding ticket first uh, when we met with them? So you bring your lunch. Pastor Dan is going to give like a 10, 15 minute devotional, uh, just whatever he's been studying, share some, some things with you. We'll eat our lunch together, we'll fellowship. And then what we want to do is we want to pray for your children and grandchildren, right? Especially those that have not yet come to faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, some that I talked to, they have, they, have, uh, they have the situation. And so I, I like this quote by D.L. Moody. I thought it's an appropriate way, maybe an encouraging way for, for those of you in this situation. He said, The impression that a praying mother leaves upon her children is lifelong. Perhaps when you are dead and gone, your prayer will be answered. Okay? Uh, my mother died not seeing our, my oldest brother come to faith in the Lord. And I'm sure she was brokenhearted about that. Okay? Uh, so it's a reality in our lives, but if you, wanna, if you want more information on that or want to tell others, uh, we hope to meet again Tuesday here at church from 11 to 1. Any quick comments in closing before we uh, pray today? Okay. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our morning. Again, Lord, we thank you for how the promise of salvation and, co and, and coming of your son, Jesus Christ, was fulfilled Lord, that promise in Genesis through the virgin birth. Lord, we are thankful for mothers and for the, role, the important role that they play just in the civilization that we live in, Lord, and also in the church. We thank you, Lord, for our, our older mothers and those that are grandmothers, Lord, the wisdom they can share with the younger, younger mothers and wives. And Lord, we pray in our service to follow that you would bless Pastor Dan. We thank you that his eyesight, Lord, uh, that it's been successful. We pray that you would help the doctors to make the final adjustments in the coming weeks. And Lord, we pray for him uh, this morning as he brings your word to us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.